thank you for this life that we're going to learn about tonight. This portion of scripture, we ask that you would break it upon our hearts. We thank you for bringing each one of us here tonight. It is not by chance or because there's nothing else to do, but you have a divine purpose for each of us sitting in this room and hearing the story and the truths that we need to learn. Break them upon our hearts, Lord. May we leave this place changed women, strengthened for the battle that is before us. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's daughters said, Amen. Okay, Deborah's story, we can kind of sum up her story by saying this. It, is, it happens during a time of terrible oppression. The children of God cry out to God for a deliverer, and he raises up a woman. Not a man, mind you, but a woman. A woman judge by the name of Deborah. The reason for that is because there were no men of valor. There were no brave men to be found. You know that, uh, that verse where, you know, has the, the godly man ceased? Where are the men of strength? Where are the men that have backbone? Where are the men that are going to, you know, fight and protect us? There were none at this time. Instead, we see the courage of two women. There's another woman that's involved with Deborah, a friend of Deborah's. At least she becomes a friend of Deborah's because she becomes a friend of God, and that's J.L., and J.L. is the woman that took the tent spike and, and put it through the temple, a Sisera, Sisera, who was the, the captain of the army. And she assassinated him, is basically what she did. Two women who had confidence in God. That's what the story is about. It's about a weak, unequipped, pathetic army. Very pathetic army. It's about a storm that God brings in order to fight this battle. It's about victory. The lesson that I see in this story is about the omnipresence of God. That God's presence is everywhere. He's everywhere at all times. It isn't that his presence is not with us. It's that we're not aware of his presence. There needs to be a greater awareness of his presence. And when we turn our back on the Lord, or we forsake him, or we don't seek his counsel, he will not invade that privilege of um, forcing himself for us to to obey or recognize his presence. And so I thought of the verse that would kind of, you know, summarize what it was, what is it that Deborah is teaching us. And the word says that if we draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto us. But the big thing is if. If we choose with our lives to draw nigh, to stay close, to walk close to the Lord, we are going to experience the miraculous, the divine intervention, God fighting our battles, defeating the enemy, giving us great victory, changing our lives to such a degree that the world just better watch out because we are women on the move. We're like Deborah, marching forth, conquering and to conquer. Courageous, unwavering faith, no doubt in God that nothing is too hard for God. That was her mindset. This is what, this is what happens when we draw nigh. But there has to be a an effort on our part. This is my desire. This is what I decide to do as a woman. I will draw near unto God. It isn't that he isn't near. It's that I don't let him near my life and my problems and my troubles. I, I kind of keep him out of, of a certain realm because I think maybe I can handle it myself or I've lost hope or whatever the case might be. But if I draw nigh, then God will fight for us. God will then lead us into victory, and he will divinely intervene when necessary in our lives. He will allow us to do certain things. There's certain things that are required of us, certain things that we need to do, deeds of kindness, um, our, our conduct, our lifestyle. But there are things that there is nothing we can do about it, and that does require God's divine intervention. He knows if we allow him to, when to intervene, when it's necessary. This is a call to wake up. There's a call of God upon our lives to wake up to rise up and go and see what God will do. This is what Deborah did. Several times she talks about, I, Deborah, arose. I arose, and I did this, and I did that. She arose to the occasion. There was a calling of God upon her life, and she said, I'll go, Lord. If you empower me, if you equip me, if you tell me what to do, I know nothing is too hard for you. I'll be your woman. Uh, Just, you know, lead me and show me what to do. The influence of Deborah touched a nation. Her entire nation was touched and drawn to the Lord. And through this lesson, I pray that we would be courageous enough to follow in the footsteps of this great woman 
as she is an example to us and what we should be. You look at Deborah, and you see that in one hand she has a sword, in her hand she has a sword, and in her heart she has a song. And oftentimes we lose our song of victory because we don't know how to use that weapon of our warfare. We've allowed the enemy to rob and to maim and to steal and to destroy our faith. We've allowed him too much reign within our lives, but we need to arise, to go forth, to awake, awake to the, to the fact that we are in a spiritual battle and be skilled in using the weapons of your warfare. In your hand you have a sword, the sword of God, prayer, the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and in your heart, a song of victory. Her song is one of the greatest in the Bible, right along with the magnificent, um, magnificent of Mary's song, the mother of Jesus, and Hannah's song. This one rates right up there, her song in chapter 5. That's what it's called, the song of Deborah, her song of victory. And it has a wonderful conclusion there in chapter 5, verse 31. Notice how she concludes this song. Giving praise to God for all the great things that he has done, she says at the end, Verse 31, chapter 5, So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when, it, when he go, goes forth in his might. And the land rested for 40 years. There was peace in the land after this battle was over. Notice that the enemies of the Lord will perish. When we draw nigh to God and God fights our battles, that enemy, whatever that might be in your life, will be destroyed. The enemy will not. Satan won't get the advantage. The flesh will not overtake us, and there will be victory. Also, the fact that those that love the Lord will be comforted. We will grow as we draw nigh unto the Lord, and we will enter into his rest. This song tells what's in her heart. She praises God for the strength to march against the enemy. Do you realize that we can't fight the enemy within our own strength? This has to be the strength of God in us. We fight this battle not with carnal means. This is a spiritual battle. Our our war, our weapons of warfare are not carnal. They're not earthy. They're spiritual to the pulling down and to the demolishing of the strongholds of the enemy. She praises God that he strengthened her for this battle. She praises him for all the great things that he has done, the good things as well as the bad, the things that she understood and the things that she didn't understand. All glory goes to God. What's in your heart tonight? Do you have a song of victory? Can you sing of the great things that God has done? Is there deep within you a song arising? He has given to his people a new song to sing. And this song isn't the fact that my life is easy or that uh, I have no troubles or that my life is trial-free, but the fact that God is at work in my life. That's what we sing about, the things of the Lord. Can you sing a song of victory? How do we get this song of victory? This song of victory wells up from deep within when we experience a personal deliverance from our enemies. Those things that try to take us away from serving the Lord or taking us away from walking close to him. When, when we have deliverance, true deliverance, there is a joy that bubbles up. There is this song of victory because God has delivered us from addictions and bad habits and things that would destroy our lives through faith in Jesus. That's our privilege. That's what, that's what the work of the Holy Spirit is all about in our lives. A song wells up when I draw near to God. When I make that conscious choice to walk close, to abide by his word, there is a song of victory that wells up within our hearts because we are experiencing his presence, a greater awareness that he is with us that he'll never forsake us. He'll walk us through every battle. He'll walk us through every trouble. He's going to tell us what to do, where to go, what to say and what not to say. We experience this song of victory when we surrender all. Now, that's a tough one because we have problems letting go of things that we cherish or things that we want, desires, cares, concerns. But when there is this sense of surrendering, And it's day by day, the little surrenders that we give to the Lord, that brings within us this song of victory. Well, let me tell you a little history about how this all all this is set up here. Soon after 
They entered the promised land. Remember, this, comes, this book comes right after Joshua. Joshua, the book of Joshua is about defeating the giants in the land. They went full on into the promised land, the land filled with milk and honey. The great and precious, exceeding great and precious promises of God is what the promised land is to us. That we understand the promises of God, that they're working in our lives. We're standing upon those promises. We're waiting patiently for God to fulfill those promises within our lives. And we're gaining victory each inch of the way. No matter where you put your foot down, it's said in the book of Joshua, God will give you that spot, that family, that household, those people. Wherever, wherever we go, that's the promise that's been given. But soon after they entered into the promised land, they turn away from God, forgetful of him from whom all blessings flow. And isn't that the way? When things go good in our lives, we tend to then... Um, not tend to our spiritual lives as well. We're on our way, happy, go lucky, and things are great, and, you know, what do we need the Lord for? Everything is just doing fine, and we tend to slack off in our spiritual commitment. Verse 1 says that the children of Israel notice the word again. Back to chapter 4. Again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Again. And, you know, it's just the story of the frailty of our humanness, that again we find ourselves disappointing the Lord, forsaking the Lord, turning from his counsel. Again, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And notice what verse 2 says. Now, this is a strong word, if you ask me. It says here, the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the captain of the host, which was Sisera. Sisera being the captain of the host, he was the captain of the army, in other words. He was a a ruthless, bloodthirsty, war-loving, torturous type of guy. I mean, he just, um, he was a terrible, terrible man. And he had an army just powerful and mighty. I mean, you couldn't come against this army. And it says that the Lord sold them to the king of Jabin, and into the hands of Sisera, who was the captain of Jabin's army. What does that mean, that the Lord sold them to the king of Jabin, the uh, king of, of Canaan? That means that God withdrew his protection from his people, and they were defenseless in fighting against the enemy. And so the enemy just had a heyday with the children of Israel. The oppression that is talked about here was as bad as when they were in Egypt, and they were under the cruel... Uh, taskmastering of Pharaoh, who made them, you know, make the bricks, and then they took the straw out of the bricks. I mean, it was just, this is how horrible the oppression was. Why were they sold to the enemy? Chapter 5, verse 8, tells us why God sold them to the enemy. In the song, Deborah declares what they were delivered from. It says that they chose new gods, then was war in the gates, Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? This is mentioning now the men only. This did not include women and children. They chose to serve other gods. That's why God sold them to the enemy. That's why God's hand of protection was lifted from them. Because they forsook the Lord. They turned their backs on the Lord. They didn't seek his guidance. They didn't want his care in their lives. They became carnal. They made friends with the Canaanites. They became unequally yoked, doing business agreements and such and such with those that were um, of the Canaanites worldly. And the result of that was this horrible oppression, chaotic times. God's people were sad and depressed. There was just their... They were prisoners within their own cities, within their own homes. There was no escape to this. They were defenseless. It says that there was not a weapon found among 40,000 men, not even a pocket knife. No weapons whatsoever. The enemy had confiscated any form of defense, and so they were just defenseless. And it goes on to say in verse 3, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. What a marvelous thing this is. And let us always remember It isn't God that is far away. We're the ones that walk away. We're the ones that will turn our back. We're the ones that don't want to listen to the counsel of the Lord. But as soon as, as soon as they cried out to the Lord, God raised up a deliverer. 
God did a mighty work. And not only that, but he defeated the enemy, wiped them out, and they had rest and peace in the land for 40 years. That's a pretty awesome God that we serve. If we would just humble ourselves before his mighty hand, he will do the miraculous in our lives. It's under these conditions that the Lord shows himself mighty to his people. All he wants us to do is to rely upon him, to cry out to him for for counsel and guidance. And so the children of Israel, verse 3 says, cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. This army was 100,000 men strong. A well-trained, well-disciplined, mean, nasty army. With these chariots of iron, this would be like tanks. This was no contest. When Deborah comes to Barak and says, we're going to fight against this army. (laughs) With what? Not even a pocket knife is found among us. What are we going to fight this awesome, mean, overpowering, mighty army? Don't you know they have 900 chariots alone besides the foot soldiers? 100,000 men strong against 40,000 weak, defenseless Israelites. There's no contest in this. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. That's a graphic description of a nation that is occupied by the enemy. In other words, the enemy is having a heyday here. The land is infested with lawlessness and crime, confusion, violence, any, you know, the laws of the land are not being obeyed. That, that's just the condition. It was unsafe to travel. The roads were not safe. You were taking your own life into your, into your own hands if you tried to, to uh, travel. The farms, the businesses were being ransacked at any given time. You could not defend yourself whether you worked all your life for that business. They lived in fortified places, bars on the windows and things like that. Does that sound like today at all? A nation that's engulfed in fear. The violence is just out of control in our world today. They had lost their liberties, their courage, and any hope for change. What about you? What about your situation? Are you in a place where you feel trapped? That your liberties have been taken away? And you're not free to be who God has created you to be? Do you feel like you're in a place that that you're being stifled or hindered? What about a hope for change? Have you come to a place in your life where there's no hope for change? It's just going to be like this forever? There's just, it's just like you're just, you're, it's like you're just getting down. And what, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to you? It is in these times, at this time, Deborah arises. But it is also times like this where God produces great women of faith, raises them up to leadership roles, leadership positions, a place of mentoring, a place of helping others who are down and out to walk in the way, and he ushers in a revival. We are, a, we are at a prime time. If we, God's people, would humble ourselves and pray, turn from our wicked ways, and follow after the Lord, and draw nigh, and stay close, and take on these attributes of Deborah. Our nation is ready for a revival. But God's people have to be convinced that that the Lord is the way, the truth, um, and and the way, the truth, and the life. Sorry about that. Brain freeze, I guess. (laughs) Look at the spectacular titles that are given to Deborah. No other woman in the Bible are given these titles. It says in verse 4, And Deborah, she is a prophetess. She is the wife of Lipidoth. It says that she is the judge of Israel at that time. It says that she dwells under this palm tree, the palm tree of Deborah, to counsel God's people. She is a great counselor. She seeks God's wisdom for each and every person that comes to her with a problem on their behalf. She doesn't want to give her own counsel. It is so important to her that she would give God's counsel to that to those to his people. It says in chapter five, verse seven, she calls herself, she says, I, Deborah, arose, notice what she calls herself, I arose a mother in Israel. The compassion, the heart of this woman for her nation, 
for those that she loves. It's that spiritual mentoring. She was a wonderful mentor. It tells us, really, basically, she was everything. She was the Supreme Court. She was the governor. She was being the judge. She was both a national and spiritual leader of her day. She was the one that made decisions. She instructed the people. She was an encourager. She encouraged those that were down and out, those that were weaker than her. She encouraged them. She was a motivator. She motivated them to live for God. You can do it if you stay nigh unto the Lord. If you draw close, if you understand where your strength and your power comes from, you're going to make it. Live for God. That's the best life we could ever live on the face of this earth. She's a motivator. She leads God's people into battle, and they victoriously win this battle. She ignites a revival. She brings the nation back to God, and they have rest in the land. Peace for 40 years. That is an awesome calling. Notice the title that she is the wife of Lipitoth. Now, that speaks volumes. Remember now, she's the judge. She is a woman of importance. She is a woman of power. She's a woman of great influence and very gifted. And it calls her here the wife of Lipitoth. Now, you would think that it would be uh, Lipitoth, the husband of Deborah, because Deborah is the one of significance. But this tells us that she was in her rightful place as a wife that we know nothing about her husband, absolutely nothing. We have no idea what kind of a, uh, if he held a position of any kind, what kind of a man he was. We know nothing except that she is now called the wife of Lipitoth, which means he was of some significance because it really should have been that he's the husband of Deborah. And so I think that just speaks volumes. She's a homemaker, just an ordinary woman with a strong desire to serve God. She didn't ask to be judge. She didn't ask to be uh, raised up to this awesome position. She just wanted to serve God. Now, it's a known fact that a woman's greatest sphere of influence is in the home. Usually men take the responsibility of leadership, but it wasn't so in this day. The men were cowards. No matter how you look at it, they were absolute cowards. This is men with no backbone. And I look at Deborah, and I see how she dealt with these men especially Barak, the captain of the Israeli army. He was also a man of power, a man of influence, a man of importance. And she does not degrade him. She doesn't put him down because he is afraid, so to say, to go by himself without her. But she does prophesy, and she tells him that you are going to forfeit your honor. She does speak truth, but not in the sense where she degrades him because he has no backbone. I think of women in this room that are either they're in a marriage where a man will not take the leadership. He's just wimping out as far as that goes. You know it. I don't know if he realizes or not, but I mean, you just know that, you know, he just, there's, that he's just not a strong man. He's not standing up for what's right. And that's a hard place to be, but it is not an excuse not to serve God and not to be the wife that God has called you to be, to encourage him in his role to motivate him to live for God, to help him in that sense of how important it is to seek God's will. Working with leaders, I mean, it just happens all, all across the board, no matter what, where you are, what you do. We find men that won't stand up for the, for the convictions of the Lord. And you do find women that are very strong in the conviction. We are so dedicated to the work of the Lord, we know what God can do. What is the matter with these men? And yet that does not make way for an excuse for you to, be, to badger or put down or point the finger or degrade the men in any way, but rather to stand your ground in the gentleness of the spirit and encourage that man who comes home from work and he's just depressed because he hates his job or whatever. That's your job, to encourage him, to strengthen him. Honey, what can I pray for you? What, what can I do to, to make your life easier? What about the strong men that some of us are married to? It says that behind every great man, there's a greater woman. And the, the, to stand with them, sometimes they are so strong that they get kind of crazy. Whoa, honey, oh, whoa, I don't know if that's such a great idea. Let's kind of talk. Could we talk about this great vision of yours? And so in both ways, there is that, that proper place of the woman. Deborah teaches us 
how to use our power and our influence and our gifts in a way that will honor God. To me, that is the greatest lesson that we can learn here because we are in a society that the men are losing their courage. They are losing perspective on life. There isn't the strong leadership that we would desire, but the prayer and standing with them, no matter what their position is, your position should not change in the Lord. You'll continue to raise those children in the ways of the Lord. You'll continue to be involved in the fellowship. You're going to continue to serve the Lord and become all that you are to be. And in that, it will encourage him. At least Barak went. He knew that he could depend on Deborah. There was such a strength that he saw in her, so much so that he wasn't going to go without her. Think about that. She wasn't aggressive. She wasn't a a loud, boisterous type of woman, just, uh, you know, abusing her power and her authority. She wasn't assertive, telling him what to do or what not to do. She understood the power of prayer. She understood how that that prayer can change the heart of a man. Instead, she came in as one that would assist when needed. Is that an awesome role for us as women, no matter what our strength is? There's women in here that are strong, and we, we, are, we, are, we are driven because there's a purpose to live for, that God has done such a work in our lives. But it isn't to mow down our brothers or to mow down our sons or those younger in the faith than us because of the strength that we have, but rather that God would channel our strength to build up and motivate those that are weaker than us. That's the call. Of on our lives. What a thing that, that is. That's how we learn to honor God. Praise God for the strength. Praise God for the direction that he gives to us and how, how just passionate we are about it, but yet not to use it to destroy, but to motivate and to encourage and to build up one another. The key to her success was not her ability, but her availability. And I love the quote that, that says, God doesn't call the qualified He qualifies the called. So we don't have to be qualified to be in the work of the Lord. All he wants you to do is say, yes, Lord, what would you have me to do? He qualifies the called. And in fact, the less qualified you are, the better off you are. Because he has to, you know, undo all that qualified stuff that you think you're so great in, in order for you to be used by him. He doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. She didn't run around telling people how great she was or, or, um, you know, how to run their lives. She didn't dictate to them what God wanted, but she shared as the, as the Lord gave her utterance in a gentle and meek way. Powerful thing. She simply made herself available. When Barak said, I will not go unless you go, verse 9, chapter 4 says, she responds to that and she says, I will surely go. And when God places that call upon our lives, that, that thing to do or not to do, Is it with our whole heart? Surely I will do it your way, Lord. God is looking for any that are just available to be an instrument in his hand. And when we come to that place, Lord, I want to be an instrument. In your hand, Lord, you're leading, you're guiding, you're doing the work. I'm just simply the instrument in which you are using. We are going to see the miraculous, and we will see divine intervention. Look at verse 6. It says, And she sent and called Barak and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take 10,000 men of the children of Nephtali and of the children of Zebulon? Isn't this what the Lord has commanded? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon. Now, Kishon, this river was not a river. This is an itty-bitty, teeny-tiny stream, drip, just little trickles of water. And he says, I'm going to bring you to this little stream, this little teeny tiny itty bitty stream. I'm going to bring Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army. I'm going to bring him there also with the chariots and his mighty multitude. And right there, I'm going to deliver him into your hand. Now, Deborah says to Barak, get the men, get this pathetic, terrible impression of an army. I mean, it doesn't even deserve the word army, really. Bring all those cowards and take them up to Mount Tabar. I don't care who they are, just anybody that will come, just bring them up there. Of the tribe of Zebulon, of the tribe of um, Neptali. At least they were, you know, open to go. Go up to Mount Tabar. 
And from Mount, Mount Tabor, now Mount Tabor is the same place that the, trans, the uh, Mount Transfiguration, where Jesus took his disciples up there and he revealed who he was and his glory and all that God had for them, remember? This is the same place. And from this vantage point, Mount Tabor, they were going to look down the valley at this little teeny stream where this army, this mighty, mean, nasty, powerful army was gathering together, and God was giving them a good look at what, was, what they were against. So this mountain is to gain perspective. It is to gain a revelation. It is to see the hand of God. And as they were up on this mountain, up on top of it, and looking down on this mighty army that they're going to fight, probably their knees are shaking, except Deborah. We're, God says go. I don't know how he's going to win, but he's going to win. And what happens at this moment is that a phenomena takes place. A storm happens. And suddenly, a downpour, hail, a lightning, this downpour is sheets of rain, and this little itty-bitty teeny tiny stream becomes a torrent of water that rushes through so, so fast that the chariots get stuck in the mud, the horses can't get their legs out, they get broken, the men are thrown into this panic and um, terror and confusion, and Deborah says, go, Barak, take your men take the weapons of the enemy, and take their weapons and destroy them. And that's exactly what happened. And Sisera, he takes off, his chariot's falling to pieces. He takes off and runs to the tent of Jael. Now, this story has a new meaning of got milk. He says to her, you got a bottle of water? I don't have water, Sisera, but I got milk. And she gives him this milk, covers him with a little blanket. He goes, night-night. And this woman takes a tent stake and puts it to his temple, and with a hammer takes it through his head, through the skull, through the brain, and nails him to the ground, and he's dead. This horrible enemy. Now, this is a new kind of war, not like what we are used to fighting, because this is the way that God fights. He isn't going to fight. My ways are not his ways, but he has a new way of fighting, and his way will always win, and it will always bring victory. How wonderful that is to... to Take, come to that place where we have perspective, that we see the hand of God. We see the miraculous. Can you imagine the strength, the adrenaline going through this army, seeing this mighty army just crying like babies, dropping their weapons, running around in confusion, hail hitting their heads. Uh, you know, they're drowning in this stream. And here comes this Israelite army that was saddest army that is in the Bible, I think. And they take those weapons and they slay the enemy. Every single one is dead. Not one survives. And the land rests for 40 years. Is that the God that you serve? Hey, amen. He is going to fight the battles, but it's not going to be the way you think. It's going to be through the miraculous, through divine intervention, through a way that it is so obvious that this is the Lord's doing. How awesome that is. How do we become a Deborah? Well, first of all, you, you, you need to be diligent wholeheartedly serve God with your whole heart. Serve the Lord right where he has you now, unless you are in sin. And if you're in sin, you flee. You get out of that situation. Otherwise, take heart. God is going to strengthen you right where you are. Be available. Lord, take me just as I am. Whatever I have and whatever I don't have, I'm just available. Do with me what you want. You have a call on my life. I want to understand what that call is. Be prepared to see miracles. Be dedicated. Offer yourself. She's saying in that song that the people willingly offered themselves. Not my will, but thine be done. And I want to end with just a little um, excerpt of Elizabeth Elliot. I think she just kind of sum, sums it all out, talking about my will versus his, uh, my desires or his desires, and it goes like this. I had been praying for something I wanted very badly. It seemed a good thing to have a thing that would make life even more pleasant than it is and would not in any way hinder my work. But God did not give it to me. Why? I do not know all of his reasons, of course. The God who orchestrates the universe has a good many things to consider that have not really occurred to me, and it is well that I leave them to him. But one thing I do understand. He offers me holiness at the price of relinquishing my own will. Do you honestly want to know me, he asks. I answer, yes. Then do what I say, he replies. Do it when you understand it. Do it when you don't understand it. 
Take what I give you, be willing not to have what I do not give you. The very relinquishment of this thing that you so urgently desire is a true demonstration of the sincerity of your long life prayer, thy will be done. So instead of hammering on heaven's door for something which is not quite clear, that is now quite clear that God does not want me to have, I make my desire an offering. The longed-for thing is material for sacrifice. Here, Lord, it's yours. He will accept the offering. He will transform it into something redemptive. He may perhaps give it back as he did Isaac to Abraham, but he will know that I fully intend to obey him. Let's pray. Father, we do honestly and sincerely, deep within our hearts, desire to be obedient children because we know that that is where the fulfillment of life is. And so, Father, will you take us once again as we make a new commitment to you. Thy will be done, Lord, not mine. And will you use me in these last days to touch many? Make us each, Lord, an awesome mentor, an awesome counselor, a motivator, Lord. There's so many people that are down and out. Help us, Lord, to to be all that you have created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.